It's a pleasure to introduce Eric and I will turn it over to you. He's our Northeast region rep as well. I think most of you probably know that. Um, and I will uh, let him take it away from here. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I'm excited to be with you all today. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Jen mentioned, our, our annual meeting just kicked off today and I was in some sessions this morning. So encourage everyone to um, sidle on over to that later this week and next week. Uh, we have a, a really cool set of sessions. Um, I work on coordinating all the breakout sessions. So I can tell you there's some really great content there. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys will hit that up. And I'm I'm in my office today, which is the first time I've done this since last March, um, which has been a fun adventure. But my son's daycare is closed because of all the snow we had. So I'm here, so I don't have a um, I don't have a three-year-old in my lap. Uh, which is, as I was Jen, I'm more worried about that distracting me than you and losing my chain of thought. So um, here we go. I um, And I encourage you to jump in and ask questions as we go. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to I'm just going to get get rolling and just keep on keep on trucking. So, um, yeah, we'll have time for questions at the end, but feel free to interrupt me um, if you'd like. Uh, and let's hit it. So, uh, what are we going to talk about today? So, uh, first things first, um, I always like to start with a little bit of a refresher on how government works. Um, we all know this, but sometimes it's helpful to make sure that we're all um, have it front of mind and are thinking about this in you know, the rest of the presentation in this context um, and have that kind of shared understanding to work with. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about effective congressional meetings. What, um, and these are, I, my focus is on federal policy. As you all know, I'm here in DC. Um, I'm at your national association, so I do. Um, this, however, a lot of this is really applicable at any level of government. So, um, but you know, we'll keep that framing in mind. But what, what does an effective congressional meeting look like? How can you plan for that? How can you execute it well? Um, we'll talk, and this is like a relatively new part of this presentation. We'll talk about advocacy in a virtual world. What can we be doing? Um, how can we be navigating Zoom meetings with members of Congress? Um, what's changed? What's different? What are some tips for success there? Um, and then, like I said, we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. So here we go. Civics 101. Um, There are three branches of government. We're going real basic here to start. So the legislative, which is um, Congress, that's who makes the laws, um, as we all know. It, they're also who creates a budget, and they're the ones who fund the government. You have the executive, where the president sits, um, and all of our agencies, so you know, like USDA is a part of the executive branch. Um, they carry out the laws that Congress passes. Um, and writes regulations that implement programs and um, rules. And then there's also the judicial branch, which we're not really going to touch on here because um, that's not what I do. It's not what you guys do. We don't, we're not attorneys. We don't sue people. Um, so what does the policymaking process look like? We start in Congress. And um, as I'm sure you guys know, there are two branches two houses in Congress, two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate, either one of them can make a law um, or make a pass, introduce a bill, can debate a bill, pass a bill that could ultimately turn into a law. However, in order for a law to pass, it has to be passed by both chambers, both the House and the Senate. Um, in some cases, both chambers will pass identical legislation and then it'll um, merge into a single bill that goes to the president. What's more common, is they each pass their own version of legislation. Um, and it will um, go into a conference committee, which is a special committee with members of both the House and the Senate that work out um, the details between those two bills. The Farm Bill works this way. So they'll each pass their own version of the Farm Bill, will go to a conference committee. That committee will um, create a, a compromise. And then it will go back to the full Congress and both the House and the Senate have to vote on the compromise version. So um, what is that? 
that means that there's a lot of different kind of influence points here. Um, we can be looking at, you know, trying to get a provision into law, starting with the House, starting with the Senate. Um, once they pass their bills, there's still the conference committee that we can be working to influence and to um, drive change there. And then um, there's that final vote for the full con Congress that, you know, if you're really opposed to something, that's the point, a leverage point there. Once a, a bill gets signed or it gets passed by Congress, it goes to the president and the president then has to sign it. And of course the president can also veto it and it can go back to Congress. Um, but once the president signs that legislation, um, then it goes to the relevant agency for rulemaking. So that's kind of the process we're wrapping up with USDA right now after the last farm bill. Um, USDA, NRCS has proposed new rules for our big conservation programs like EQIP and CSP. Um, ASAP and RCPP. Um, some of those rules like EQIP and CSP have been finalized. Uh, some are in the process of being finalized like ASAP and RCPP. Uh, and then once those rules are final, then we move on to enactment and enforcement. So um, enactment would be something like EQIP where we go out, you know, we have the rules written, let's go out and put the program into, into practice. Enforcement would be more um, thinking about like Clean Water Act regulations, where um, you know the, the waters of the U.S. The, um, rule that's been debated recently. That's a more of an enforcement um, mechanism. So now, finally, we can examine this through the lens of where the action steps are: Congress or the administration, but also what that legislative process is, where how a bill becomes a law, and then the executive process, which is um, how this idea of a bill, the big picture framing in a piece of legislation becomes a actionable program or policy. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So, good. so told you we we're starting real basic. So that's that's our kind of our our joint understanding of how policy means. So that the next thing to kind and the final thing on this topic to kind of be thinking about is uh, there's some things like the Farm Bill that's a, a law that enacts programs, um, but then there's a special process called appropriations, which is the annual budgeting and funding cycle for the, the government. The budget is how much money the Congress can spend overall each year, and that's a number that Congress determines for itself. Uh, so they will come to an agreement um, that will say we're going to spend, you know, a trillion dollars this year. Um, and the budget is that top line number. Appropriations is the process where Congress takes that top line number and divides it into each and every pot of funding, each and every program. So the budget tells us how much we're spending. Appropriations is that process by which we determine, okay, we're spending this much overall in the federal government. That means that we're going to spend. Um, you know, however many million dollars on conservation technical assistance, for example. Um, this is an annual process. Uh, the kind of tricky thing when we think about appropriations is for us, for uh, people who care about agriculture policy and conservation, is some of the programs that we care the most about, like EQIP, CSP, RCPP, ASAP, are all funded through the Farm Bill. So the Farm Bill doesn't just create the programs, um, it also funds them, which is uh, pretty common in agriculture policy and very uncommon everywhere else in the federal government. So when you start talking to people who deal with like education policy about this kind of stuff, they're like, what are you talking about? Um, but for us, you know, so the Farm Bill, we do some of that. Um, then appropriations, things like conservation technical assistance, that's where we really fight for that funding. Um, so we're in a kind of a quirky place, but it actually is um, a pretty Cool position to be in. Um, the, the final note on appropriations, of course, is the Congress is pretty bad at it. So we very, very rarely finish the fiscal year with uh, funding enacted for the next fiscal year. Fiscal year. In theory, you know, by the time the, the fiscal year ends, we should have the next year funding agreement made. We should, everything should be in place to start. Um, often we don't. That's when we start talking about a government shutdown because there's no money to fund the government with. 
Um, so usually we begin the year um, and the fall and early winter are a time of continuing resolution where Congress passes a short-term extension, um, keeps all the prior year funding in place until they can work out an agreement um, that usually happens around the end of the calendar year. Uh, I mean, this doesn't like keep me up at night, but I know this drives our our friends over at NRCS and nuts because they really want to know how much money they have to work with for the entire year, um, not for the next three months or two weeks, what have you. Uh, but that's that's where we are. So we good so far. Okay. Folks are going to interrupt me if they have questions. We're moving on. So now we got kind of the the basis for what how how policy gets made. We're going to talk a little bit now about what how you should be meeting with members of Congress. What makes for an effective meeting? So the first thing I want to touch on here is uh, grassroots and grass tops advocacy. Um, and this is two different strategies, and I think that it's important, especially right now, as we're doing more virtual work, where we're not able to just show up on the Hill in person and meet with our congressional delegation, um, to think a little bit more strategically about what advocacy looks like. And this is an important distinction to start with. So grassroots advocacy is about mobilization. Um, I am sure everyone here has gotten an email from some type of um, organization they're associated with that's so like click here to tell Congress to save the polar bears or you know click here to tell Congress to you know support our farmers um, and it sends you to a you know a tool online where you build you can send a form email and they have the email all written for you and they send it off to your congressional representatives for you they work with a fancy database and web program that figures out where you're located and who your members of Congress are and you know slots their name into the letter, all of that. That is um uh oh I just got kicked out. Sorry guys, one second. All right. I don't know what happened. Um so that's grassroots. And that can be really great when you are looking for a show of force when you want to show that the public just like overwhelmingly supports your issue. And, you know, one thing that jumps to mind recently with this is all of the Supreme Court nominations that have been going on um, or were going on with the Trump administration. Um, we saw this particularly with Brent Kavanaugh, but there's just like this congressional offices were getting so many phone calls um, and emails, but they're getting so many phone calls that when you called an office normally there would be an intern or a um, you know entry level staff person there that would answer the phone and be like, "Hey, hi, uh, this is you know Senator Van Hollen's office. How can I help you?" They put up like automated answering messages because they couldn't handle the call line. Like that is grassroots advocacy at its like zenith, right? Um, it's about mobilization. It's about getting just like drowning an office in um, an outpouring of support for your issue. It's, you know, if you're looking to make a big splash, like with a Supreme Court nominee, it can be a really effective strategy. Um, however, when a congressional office is looking at what, what did the public have to say about this, if they get 50 emails that are all identical and they look clearly you know, the Sierra Club forum email, they count that as like one person reaching out. They don't count that as 50 people email them, they count that as a single, a single constituent voice, their opinion. Um, grass tops advocacy is kind of the, the opposite of this. Um, and it really makes up for the, um, the, some of the, like some of the drawbacks of grassroots advocacy. So grass tops is all about relationships. That you are rather than you know the person down in the ground who's doing you know very little, um, but is there's a lot of you and you're branching out. You're the person standing up, waving out above everyone else, 
Um, you've been on the Hill several times, you know the staffers, you know their names, you have their email addresses, you've built relationships, and you're able to give them a call, shoot them an email, and speak authoritatively about a topic. And they're going to know that you're not just somebody who sends a form email, they're gonna know that you're somebody who actually knows what you're talking about and that has information for them and is um, going to be able to guide them in a direction that's really positive and is gonna help them succeed. So it not every, you, the strategy with grass tops is not everybody can do it, right? Like it's not something where you have every constituent in a congressional district is capable of being the advocate. Um, but it, you guys are in a perfect position to do this, um, to really put in the time and build relationships and to be seen as a trusted expert on these issues. And you, many of you already are. I mean, I'm not trying to suggest that you are not doing any of this already. I know our folks do a really great job. Um, but there's a real there's a real difference between you know click here to save the polar bears and being able to show up and talk about the intricacies of equip and why this makes a difference within this individual congressional district. Um, and now that we're doing so much remotely, you're not going into offices. We can't do a traditional client. Being able to um, call someone up, being able to send an email, and knowing that the other person on the other side is actually reading it and cares what you have to say. Is so much more important. This is you spent all this time building these relationships, and now is when we're cashing those. So, um, you have a congressional meeting coming up. Let's think about how we prepare for that meeting. The first thing we're going to do is um, it's important to know the issues. So, you, maybe you're going in to talk to someone, you know that you want to talk about um, EQIP because it's the farm bill cycle and that's something that folks on the Hill are asking questions about. Study up a little bit, you know, make sure that you really understand the program, that you are you can be that expert on it. Um, so understanding both the policy and the practical stuff, but also kind of like you're going in to talk to this member of Congress, what, how do they feel about it? What's relevant to them? Um, kind of how do you th think they're going to come down on an issue? This is the kind of stuff I can help you with too. If you give me a call, I'm happy to help you work through that kind of stuff. Um, next is planning out your message. So I show up and I can meet with a member of Congress or their staff member and tell them all the great things that my folks are doing. And that's good. What's better is when you show up and you talk to a member of Congress or their staff and you tell them about the great things that you yourself are doing. So using those local examples, being able to say, um, our district implemented this project here, look at some pictures of it. It's so much more valuable than me going in and saying, you know, hey, did you know that Talbot's doing, you know, cover crops? Having them show up and like having the pictures, it makes a huge difference. Um, that is where your strength is, is being able to talk about the work you're doing, the work that's going on on the ground. So it's important to know if you want to talk about cover crops, how that links to um, funding for that and equip and CSP. But it's still like being able to talk as the practitioner, as the person who's the constituent is so much more valuable. Um, the next thing to be thinking about is making a game plan for the meeting, uh, especially if you have more than one person. Who's gonna lead the meeting? You know, when, um, whether you're out in the field or you're on Zoom, you know, who's gonna say, hello, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. We're with, um, you know, the Prince George's County Soil Conservation District, um, and we're excited to talk to you today. Who's that person that opens? Um, who's going to speak about what issue? You know, if you know you want to cover three things, who are you assigning to each of those topics? If you think about that in advance, everything flows much more smoothly and you're less likely to get off track. Um, and then finally, what materials do you need? Are there handouts you can bring? Can you bring pictures with you? Um, you know, if you're installing a cool conservation practice that requires you know, like a small piece of equipment, can you bring it with you? Can you bring that like moisture sensor with you to show that off? Um, that's the first thing that jumped to mind. I'm not suggesting that the moisture sensor is the right thing to bring to a congressional meeting, but you know what I mean. Um, other props. So um, now it's time, you've done all the legwork, now it's time for the actual meeting. Um, you're conducting the meeting, you wanna arrive on time. Um, and one of the things with arriving on time is not too early. Um, especially if you're doing the meetings in person, it freaks people out if you show up half an hour early. I know my audience. I know our district supervisors. 
like to be early to things. I know that if we have a meeting and breakfast is scheduled at seven, people would be down there at 6.30. However, um, if you show up to, a, especially if you're you know, meeting in person on the Hill and you show up like half an hour early, those offices are tiny. The person's probably in a different meeting at the time. It just kind of freaks people out. So hang out in the hallway, chill somewhere, go get a cup of coffee, whatever. You want to be on time, but don't not like, not early, early. And you, obviously you don't want to be late. Um, but that's a little more straight. You're gonna want to stay focused. Um, members of Congress love to talk about things that they're doing well and they're excited about. In the Venn diagram of stuff members of Congress love to talk about and things you're here to talk about, the overlap is not very big. So they're gonna be wanting to talk about cool things they're doing, the bill they introduced, the program they saved, the place they went last week. Um, that may not be what you want to be talking about. So you can, you know, like let them talk a little bit, let them get their point across, let them tell their story. But your job is to keep them focused, because especially if you have some kind of ask, you want them to support a program that maybe they're not really interested in, or um, you know, maybe you're going to meet with. Andy Harris and your goal is to get him to spend an extra $20 million on something. Um, that's not the that's not the easiest ask. So he's gonna want to kind of veer off track so he can stay in his comfort zone of like things I feel good about. Um, your job is to keep things on track to make sure that you're gonna have time in the short meeting to um, make sure that you can cover the material you want to. Um, it's important to have a relevant ask ready so to make sure that you know what that member of Congress can do for you. Maybe it's voting a certain way on a bill. Maybe it's supporting a program. Maybe it's introducing legislation. Maybe it's um, you know supporting a funding level for something. Um, maybe it's you know you need help with something going on with your service center. You know I was working with our folks up in Maine because one of the service centers closed and nobody had an office and like. The district was in the only one that was in the county still, and NRCS was operating out of another county, like, and it was a disaster. Um, so one of the things we did was we reached out to Congress and we're like, hey, can you like lean on NRCS a little on headquarters to like get this resolved? Like something went wrong here. Um, I think it was like GSA's fault. I don't think it was NRCS's fault, but like we got to, you know, they can help with that kind of stuff too. But you got to have that ask ready, knowing what that is. Because people, you know, they're gonna, they're happy to talk to you about like, cool stuff, but it's um, so much more powerful if you can go in and connect that cool stuff to something specific and actionable. Especially if you're meeting with staff, they want to know what they can do. Um, they want to be able to leave the meeting and have like an action step they can take for you. Um, so having that ready for them is really important. Um, you want to make sure you're respectful. You know, whether you like the politician or not, whether you voted for them or not, you still are respectful and you still pretend like you love them um and it's it goes both ways like you're one of their voters so they want you to like them um you're somebody that in the next two four six years could be voting for them again so they're i have there i've done a lot of meetings with um constituents and members of congress and very very rarely are the members of congress anything but charming across the political spectrum across the country um across issue areas they are almost always charming um there have been a couple that have been jerks happy to tell those stories later but in general you're gonna they're just they're gonna be really likable so there's no reason to come in combative or anything but um you know trying to be a respectful likable person yourself and the last thing is don't lie and this sounds silly but when you're in a meeting and you're under pressure and you want to look like an expert and it's like your moment to shine and you get asked this question that comes kind of out of left field and you don't know the answer there's this intense pressure to guess or make something up and i know because i feel it when i'm in these meetings i want to be like the expert and the resource and they're like how many acres of cover crops did they put in um, or like what percentage of that county is in cover crops and you want to be like i don't know like i think it's like 50 percent. i don't know that i'm making that up the better thing to do is to resist that urge and to say, I will follow up with you. Because not only then are you going to tell the truth, but you're also going to have an opportunity. It gives you an opening to follow up later. 
you're going to want to send an email or something afterwards thanking them for the meeting anyways and that kind of email is always easier if you're like hey you would ask this question let me tell you the answer you have this excuse to reach back out again so don't lie um so the, the key elements here of effective advocacy um the first and these are kind of wrapping up what we've been talking about so far the first one is making your voice work. so making sure that you're speaking up that you're reaching out often um what i tell people is to invite their members and this is like not as relevant in the moment because of the world we're in but i tell them to invite members of congress to everything every field day every meeting every event they're usually not going to show up once in a blue moon they will um but you want to engage them as much as you possibly can uh, making sure you're telling your story and when we say telling your story we mean um, telling about your unique experience on the ground as a practitioner, as an expert, um, what you, why you're there, what you bring to the table, uh, and then building relationships. And like we said, this is what's really critical right now is the building relationships with members of Congress, the decision makers, and their staff. Um, staff know more about the issues than the members do. Staff are the really important ones here. Um, but you build those relationships over time. You show up again and again, and you're able to. Um, you're able to be to have someone that they're turning to as a trusted source of information. So that's really, um, that's why we do this work. And now is a great moment to shine. So advocacy in virtual world, we're not gonna be doing this. We're not gonna be out on a tractor in a field um, doing a congressional meeting. Uh, this is a, this picture is from a real meeting I did. That woman up on the tractor is Virginia Fox. She's a representative from North Carolina. She wanted this photo. She wanted to be up on that tractor. Um, it's one of the reasons I love farm tours and doing these meetings on a farm is you, members of Congress love being out of the office. They love getting to go and like check out equipment and cool stuff and see things growing and holding a baby chicken and having like a life-changing experience with a baby chicken in their hand, which is something that happened with a member of staff in Kansas. Um, we can't do that right now, which sucks. But like, what can we do? How can we make these virtual meetings as effective as possible? The first is leverage those personal relationships, cash in on all of that work you've been doing up until now. Um, being able to send a personal email, make a phone call, reach out, um, staying in touch that way. That's, it's so important. You can't just drop in on somebody and like announce yourself. Second thing is following the office's lead. Um, some offices, you know, like everybody's got a different uh, software package they want to be using, whether that's, you know, like GoToMeeting like we are right now, or Zoom, or Microsoft Teams, or what have you. Use whatever the office is asking you to use. Um, it's a nice way to come with the they want to on the inside page. Um, if they want to do a video meeting, do a video meeting. If they want to do a phone call, do a phone call. If they're you know meeting in districts, that's cool. If they're meeting in DC, like what whatever works, um, you know, listen to them and work with what they're proposing. Um, so much planning it takes so much more planning to do one of these virtual meetings. Um, guys, we all know anybody who's done like a Zoom happy hour or like coffee break. Um, I hate them. Um, I think that they are so awkward. Uh, people try to talk over themselves, right? Um, you, we did for like my my wife's family at Christmas. We like did a a thing where we all opened our presents together on Zoom, and we were everybody was like would start to talk over one another, but then stop. And it, you can't have a conversation that flows and is normal because like you don't know who's talking when and what's going on and you feel all this pressure that what you're gonna say has to be profound because you're like interrupting everyone and nobody else can talk if you're talking. It sucks. Anyways, that is the what that's what you're up against with these things. So you really have to take the time to do the pre-work, figure out who's gonna say what, um, when how the structure of the meeting's gonna go, when you're gonna turn to um, the next person, uh, you got to you gotta do all of that. You want to test everything ahead of time, make sure that you're comfortable with the platform that you're using. Um, you know, if you're, I'm sure people have experience with Zoom now, sometimes you 
enter a Zoom meeting and depending on the settings that's set up for it, your camera's off, sometimes it's on, sometimes your microphone's off, sometimes your microphone's on. Um, you know, making sure that you're comfortable and you've tested all of that stuff out so you know what's going on. Um, making sure you have plan B in case things go wrong. You know, um, if the snowstorm comes in and closes daycare and I'm not available to be on the meeting, who's going to step in and cover the material I was going to cover? You know, is Jen ready to, to fill in for me? Um, making sure that all of that is figured out ahead of time. Um, you want to be professional. It's on your computer. You might be sitting on your couch, but you want to present yourself just like you would in person. So um, making sure that you you dress nicely. You know, you're not like wearing your pajamas. Um, making sure that you have yourself set up so that people can see you well. Um, that you're not on your phone and you like just looking up somebody's nose. Um, it, I've been on a shocking number of calls recently where people were driving and on video at the same time. I do not recommend that, not just for the safety reasons, but it's real weird of an experience to be on the other end of that. Um, so, you know, be thinking about how you would present yourself in person and really like aim to try to replicate that as much as possible in this um, in this virtual sense. Um, and then last you guys speak up. One thing um, I heard, I have a friend who, uh, she works for a senator um, from Pennsylvania and I was chatting with her the other day and she said that for whatever reason, she's been getting more calls from lobbyists, like the professional folks that have, you know, like 10 different clients and, um, you know, represent Pepsi. She's been getting more calls from those people since the pandemic started than she ever would have before. And she's like, something about not having to meet in person, having only via phone calls, like empower these people to just like harass her every week. And she is like so tired. So, but anyways, that's what you're up against, right? Like you have these people that are going to be like, are harassing members of Congress even more because everything's virtual. So you shouldn't sit home and think like, oh, well, you know, we can only do this virtual meeting and I guess there's not that much value in it. So we really just like, we shouldn't bother. Because those other folks are talking their ear off. They're not sitting at home. They're like, well, let's, we might as well do it more. So you gotta speak up, you gotta do the meetings, you gotta get out there, you gotta send me emails, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever you're comfortable with, and whatever that relationship you built with folks are up until now, leverage that, make, and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, because they're not they're not hearing from the right people, you know? they're hearing from the, the people that work at big law firms. So, that's what I have to cover for you guys. Um, is there, what kind of questions do you guys have? What can I answer? Hey Eric, hey, Eric. this, this is, is Keith. Keith. Oh, go ahead. Oh, this is Taryn Hills from NRCS. How, how's everything going this afternoon? Hey, good, how's it going? Very good. Hey, I really appreciate your presentation and you made a whole lot of great points and I guess while other people uh, maybe thinking about comments or questions that they want to ask you. I did want to take this opportunity to to also add that, uh, you know, NRCS is always available to assist in a information and education role with these kinds of efforts. And so, you know, districts don't need to to be too concerned about uh, maybe the the fact that they're not as familiar with or you know not as familiar with some of our programs or they may not have the expertise or may not feel like they know what to ask for or what to what to say or what have you uh oftentimes you know we you know we've always had a long history of accompanying uh conservation district uh members board members other people who go uh in their role in terms of lobbying and obviously we don't lobby co congress so that's not you know our role but we're certainly there to add that information and education role, answer questions, clarify things about our programs, and to help uh, the districts uh, tell their story. So uh, just wanted to make sure we offered that up and to make sure people know that that's something that we're still uh, very happy to do. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that one of the, you know, building on that, like one of the wonderful things about districts is we can say the things that NRCS can't, right? Um, as Dr. Hilton said, 
we, they can they can talk about what they're doing in NRCS can, but they can't lobby on behalf of themselves. So we have the ability to do that. So you can send you know NRCS in to talk about you know all of the great work they're doing on the ground, and then you come in and back clean up and say like, and this is why we need all of this funding to back up that work. Um, they can't. They can't do that for themselves, so that's an even you know greater responsibility on us, and um, makes it even more important that we're the ones in the room carrying that message forward and making that ask because there's there isn't anybody else doing that. Eric, I thought of something while you were talking, um, and it was you know our experience. Um, You've been in the room when, when we've gone to, uh, to do the fly-in um, and had an experience where we met with a senator who talked for whatever he wanted to talk about for like the entire time. And then he pointed at me and he said, all right, you know, tell me in a minute why you're here. Um, so I think it's a really good idea to have kind of that elevator speech sort of ready to go, like where you can stretch it out or condense it as much as you need to with the time um, that you have. And I think it also gets to your point about, you know, trying to maintain focus and, and steer the conversation so that I wasn't condensed into a minute in the first place, you know. But, you know, that was something that I think I took away from that meeting that I would definitely be prepared for going forward. Um, and the other thought, I, I had one more, and that's with the virtual format. Sometimes it actually makes it a little bit easier to meet with elected officials because uh, they don't necessarily, you take a lot of the investment of time to like travel someplace or, you know, to come back and they can pop in and out of meetings more efficiently than they would be if they had to come out to a loca to a physical location. Um, so, I mean, there's pros and cons with that for sure, but it, it kind of opens up an opportunity in some cases that wasn't there before. Definitely, definitely. It was uh, refugee policy that he talked our ear off of. But that's, that's, I mean, that's like what I've seen before. There's sometimes you, you just can't right. remember what the issue was, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta let them, you know, kind of blow themselves out a little bit on whatever they're talking about. You steer the conversation back and you do what you can. Mm -hmm. Hey, Eric, this is Keith Olinger from Howard Soil. Um, we had a lot of changes this last session with the election and everything, and, and Peterson lost, and, you know, he was an actual farmer, and he had served for a long, long time. What are your what are your thoughts on the new folks coming in? Any strategies, anything, anything different you recommend or how to approach them? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think it's going to be really interesting to see how things shake out. Um, like, as you mentioned, Peterson lost a longtime chair, ranking member of House Ag. Uh, he has written many farm bills. Um, the new chairman is David Scott from Georgia. Um, he's a, um, a great guy. He does not represent a farming district. Um, I think. He hasn't really advertised that, but he's suburban Atlanta. Um, and I've met with his office before and they've been like, well, you know, we don't really have an ag here. So we're like more interested in this other stuff, um, which is fine. He's kept most of the staff around, which is really great. So most of the committee staff that we know are still there. And I think that that will be really great for continuity. Um, but one thing that we, you know, is an issue every Congress is there is a hierarchy amongst committees in Congress. Um, some committees are called, they're called A committees, and it's stuff like appropriations. We talk about appropriations, that's where you like get to fund the government. And everybody wants to be on appropriations. Um, in the House, everybody wants to be on energy and commerce. Um, that's, which has like a hilariously broad portfolio that covers, you know, like everything from climate change to healthcare. Um, there are also some committees that are not A committees, that are B committees, um, like agriculture, that are less um, less desirable. Um, there's nothing, I love the A committee. I have no issue with it, but it's not, people aren't like, unless you come from a big ag district, people aren't like chomping at the bit to be on ag the same way. So what that means is that we often get a lot of new members and then some of them stick around 
and some of them move on to one of these higher profile committees. So every year, you know, there's people that came onto the committee in their first discretion, and they finally got their shot at being on a probes, so they, like, they disappear. So we do a lot of time relationship building in agriculture, and we do a lot of work on education. Um, because even if you're on the Ag Committee, doesn't mean you know anything about agriculture. And even if you know something about agriculture, it doesn't mean you know something about conservation. Um, one of the um, both like blessings and curses of Peterson was that he, he used to have a CSP contract. Um, he, I believe, had a CRP contract. He knows the programs because he's used them. Um, that means that he also has like his own personal ax to grind around things. Um, he was not the best champion for CSP, even though Minnesota uses a ridiculous amount of CSP because he's like, this was too complicated, so I quit the program. Um, you don't get that with somebody who hasn't used the program, but like, so it's like a double-edged sword, right? But um, just because somebody, you know, farms doesn't mean they know anything about conservation. So we, we are all collectively always have to spend a lot of time working with new members, making sure people understand the issues, making sure that they understand conservation so that they're able to step into those roles and, um, and lead. And it's, I, I think it's a, you know, a particular issue this year with three out of four of the principals on the Ag Committee being new, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge every time. Mike Mason, uh, you're on the call here, right? Is there anything specific? Um, what does it look like to reach out to Maryland legislators? Or, you know, is there anything you want to add on to what Eric's talked about here? Yeah, and <clears throat> Eric, that was a great overview kind of, you know, at the federal level here in Maryland um, and like a lot of state legislatures, you know, we're pushed into a time crunch. Um, in Maryland, we have 90 continuous days to try and get as much as we can. Um, done at this time. And so for us this year, uh, especially, we've had to kind of pivot for our clients' interests and in, in reaching out to folks. Um, I will tell you, in Maryland this year, do not hesitate to reach out to your local folks. Um, a lot of them have extended office hours and have their staff around the clock um, to be able to have those uh, discussions. As Eric kind of mentioned, being organized and having your points, um, you know, and not letting personal feelings or anything enter the office in the discussion is the most important thing. Uh, at times, I know it's tough, um, you know, and, and we've seen the, the negative ramifications uh, from it. But, um, you know, having an opportunity to kind of educate people as a component is, you know, what I find most important. Um, you know, when you're in front of them, because um, so much of it is just the fact of a lack of knowledge and understanding of it um, from it. So if you get those opportunities to get in front of them, um, you know, more than happy to, to facilitate meetings and everything with it. But, um, you know, the, in this kind of day and age where you are, it's we found that that folks and staff and legislators have become a little bit more available. Um, now, the hard part is, is that you can't, you know, chase them down in the hallway or, um, you know, catch them between meetings or other stuff as everything is virtual. So um, that does take a little bit of the personal touch out of it, though, um, at times. So it, it can be a struggle. Eric, this is Lee McDaniel from the Hartford District. What's up, Lee? I'd like to ask you what the pluses and minuses are between meeting with Hill staff versus field staff? Um, <laughs> that is an interesting question. Let me plug in my laptop. Um, it is, oh geez. Um, I'm gonna keep going. Hang with me guys. I have a new laptop. Like I said, this is my first time back in the office. Um, Hill staff versus field staff. All right, so just, well, everybody still there? Yes. Okay, why? Oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on with the computer. Imagine how much worse this would be if I had like a three-year-old in my lap. Okay, so. 
hill staff versus field staff. It really depends on the congressional office um, and how it's set up. And this is a case, Lee, where I think having some personal relationships and spending time with people and building rapport really matters. Um, I have a friend who works, who used to work for a um, member from California, uh, and they aided their field staff um, in the DC office. They did not get along. It was like, it was almost like more damaging to have the field staff bring your, your message to DC than it would be to and do anything else. Um, that's pretty unusual, but that's, you know, it can be, there can be issues there. Um, on the flip side of that, there's some members, particularly in the Senate, where you have the actual substantive policy expert is out in district. So Senator Leahy in Vermont, his um, natural resource staffer is based in Vermont. So if you're, you know, like going into the, the field office to talk to somebody, you could be talking to the person who advises the senator on substantive issues. So it can be kind of a tricky thing to navigate. Um, uh, senator Roberts in Kansas was another case where his ag staffer was like back up. Um, so uh, it's really, you know, like do the initial meetings, get to know people, and you'll start to get a feel for them. Um, and who's in the right place where. And the other thing with that is folks are fluid too. So there's a um, there's a staffer for um, it was Representative Custer in New Hampshire, who I kept running into him at our um, state meetings up there because he was the one that would always show up on behalf of the set, or the representative and you know would say hi and do all that kind of stuff. He ended up moving to DC. So I was in the office one day meeting with um, somebody else and he wandered through. I was like, what are, you what are you doing here? And it's like, oh, I'm, I moved to DC. I got a job in the office here. So again, you know, people move around a lot. So building relationships with people, you know, can pay off down the road too. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things you got to really kind of jump in and feel out as you go and uh, and take your time. Any other questions for Eric? Mm -hmm. okay. Guys, if you don't ask any more questions, I could have gone away with not plugging my computer in. I would look so much cooler. So yeah, I think you'd look fine. You're all right. I just uh, thank you, to Eric. That was a great presentation. Uh, I think we got a lot out of that. And certainly it's timely with the uh, change in administration and so on. So thank you for your presentation. So um, Happy to do it.